Greetings, everyone, and welcome to episode nine of our fall, spring, fall 2016 <laughs> virtual office hour series on the American Revolution and our revolutionary class. My name is John Fee. I teach American history here at Messiah College. Our producer is Abby Blakeney. She's behind the camera, as always. She just got her student teaching assignment today, so we're excited to hear about that and where she'll be teaching in the spring. Um, not to worry, though, she'll still be she'll still be producing the off virtual office hours while she's student teaching. We have dueling George Washingtons here. We have the bobblehead and the Pez dispenser. We gave the rest of the founding fathers the day off because today we are going to be talking about a letter that George Washington wrote in September of 1776 to John Hancock, the president of the Second Continental Congress. Uh, we have finally got into some military history in our American Revolution class. So we've been talking about some of the battles and some of the war and some, some things about the war and some military strategy. Uh, and in this letter, uh, Washington is very much whining about uh, the army that he has. Uh, to put it into context, he's just been driven um, out off of Long Island by the army, the British army, in the so-called Battle of Brooklyn or the Battle of Long Island. Uh, he is now in Harlem Heights, uh, where he is on the run, basically. The British are going to eventually drive him out of Manhattan, uh, out of New York, and, and the across New Jersey in the next several months. So Washington is not in good shape, and he blames part of his problems on uh, his, his sort of very weak army. And he suggests in this letter several problems uh, with the army in the early years, early months, I should say, of the war. Uh, one is low pay. So as we look at this document and unpack it a little bit, um, he says uh, many of these soldiers are not getting paid enough. Their pay is too small, uh, too low, I should say. Um, and then says um, the officer makes you the same reply with this further remark. Uh, talking about the officers in his army, he says that his pay will not support him, and he cannot ruin himself and family to serve his country when every member of the community is equally interested and benefited by his labors. The few, therefore, who act upon principles of disinterestedness are, comparatively speaking, no more than a drop in the ocean. So here Washington is comparing uh, the kind of self-interest uh, of his soldiers. Many of them are militia. Many of them are signed up for short-term contracts and then they need to go back home and handle their harvests and their daily activities on their farms and in their communities. Um, but Washington's saying they're paid so low that it's very hard for them to be disinterested. It's very hard for them to be anything but self-interested because their pay will not quote-unquote support him or them. So I think this is, a, this is one of Washington's arguments to try to establish what he says later in the document, an army upon a more permanent footing, uh, a more professional army. Uh, and by the end of the war, the, the uh, Continental Army moves uh, in that direction. Uh, another problem, I think, is militias. Washington has never been a fan of the militia. Uh, these are people who are mostly citizen soldiers. They're very poorly trained. Uh, they do have some shining moments, for example, in the American Revolution, such as later on at the Battle of Saratoga and some other places. But at this point, the militia, uh, Washington's wondering how he can sustain a, a, uh, uh, a war against Great Britain with militia. So he says in this letter, um, to place any dependence on the militia, is assuredly resting upon a broken staff. Men just dragged from the tender scenes of domestic life, unaccustomed to the din of arms, totally unacquainted with every kind of military skill. Uh, he goes on, he says, when, when, the, when the battles get tough, uh, their lack of skill makes them timid and ready to fly from their own shadows. So he talks about them getting sick constantly and so forth. So again, Washington, not a big fan of the militia. And one of the reasons he write this, writes this letter is to push for a more professional or permanent army. Now, in order to get a permanent army, uh, Washington has to challenge some prevailing beliefs that many in the British world uh, have about so-called standing armies. Uh, one of the reasons the colonists want to use militia is because militia are citizen armies uh, and they will sort of disband. People will go back to their ordinary lives once the threat is over. 
a standing army, historically, Britain, British people have always feared a standing army because a standing army is uh, prone to uh, being taken over by a tyrannical leader who might use the army to take away liberties. So there's this constant fear. We saw this in the 1760s especially uh, with the Quartering Acts and then even the Coercive Acts, the, the Quartering Act that came about as part of that, this fear of British redcoats. So this is often preventing many in the Second Continental Congress from going with a professional army. Washington, though, responds and says, the jealousies of a standing army and the evils to be apprehended from one are remote. And in my judgment, situated and circumstanced as we are, not at all to be dreaded. So here he's challenging that notion, right? I know, I understand the dangers of standing armies, but in this case, the danger is not that great. Uh, and Washington's actually going to convince the Second Continental Army to give him leadership of a more professional army as the war goes on. Uh, so these are some of the military concerns that George Washington, the Continental Army, the Revolutionary Cause, the Second Continental Congress uh, are having to face uh, as this war gets underway in the summer and fall of 1776. We'll be back next time uh, and talk a little bit more about this course we're teaching on the American Revolution. Uh, so have a good week.